Hello, uh, my name is Paul Duchenko, and I'm going to tell you in this series of uh, tutorial videos uh, a little bit about spatial cognition. And I start by asking, wh what is space? And kind of our everyday way of thinking about it, we think about outer space. And this is a picture from the Hubble telescope showing all the different galaxies within the universe. But in our day-to-day -day lives, we're more interested in terrestrial space. That is how we navigate through our everyday environments on the Earth. Terrestrial space um, can be divided into two classes. Uh, one class is what we call near space, uh, and that uh, can be conceived of as things within an arm's reach. So here's a photo of my desk. I'm not sitting there at the, the time of the photo, but this is my desk. It's my coffee cup, my glasses. And so if I was to reach for my coffee cup, I would reach out my left arm and grab my coffee cup. If I was to move my mouse around, it would be with my right arm. And that's what we call egocentric space. So I'm talking about the position of objects relative to me. Now, if a student came into my room and sat then across from me and then reached out for my coffee because they were thirsty or something, um, they would reach out with their right arm. So the coffee cup is to the right of, uh, of the student. And so the coffee cup's in a different relative position to the student or to myself. And this is egocentric space. The complement of egocentric space is what we call, or what I call, far space. And far space it can be con conceived of as the space that we would use a GPS for or a map. It's where we are on the planet, okay? And so it's absolute space, and that, that space doesn't change whether we're there or not. And so this is a photo uh, of the mountains in uh, the U.S. state of Georgia from the, taken from the Appalachian Trail. And when I was walking there, I carried a map, and on that map I could find out where I was in absolute space. Uh, this type of space is called allocentric space. Well, why is spatial cognition interesting? Uh, I would argue it's interesting for a, a variety of reasons. First, navigation itself is interesting. We use a variety of different tools. We could use a map or a compass, and or map and compass, uh, a GPS, different techniques for finding our way and, and different strategies for finding our way you know, on this planet. Um, it can be a challenge. This is a photograph of the uh, Hampton Court maze outside of London, and here's um, when I was walking, wandering through it, and it's very uh, difficult to, to find your way through this maze. So uh, spatial cognition can be an interesting challenge for us. Spatial cognition is also interesting because we know a lot about it. Uh, early studies in psychology focused on using rats on mazes, and th the idea there was to use a kind of a basic, a simpler model of human behavior and to try out to find out the basic principles of learning and memory. But in fact, what they did, in addition to that, is they found out a lot about uh, the spatial abilities of uh, mammals. And so the way in which uh, animals, rats, such as rats, solve mazes uh, is somewhat similar to the strategies that we use for navigating in the world. Uh, Complementing this, uh, subsequent studies you looking at uh, the mammalian brain um, have identified different neural circuits that seem to be specialized for encoding uh, our location in our world, our direction in our world, and various aspects of the spatial, uh, our spatial world. And we'll talk about these in subsequent tutorials. In addition to knowing a lot about the brain and the behavior, um, spatial cognition is interesting because it, it goes wrong. In aging, and in particular in conditions such as Alzheimer's disease, uh, individuals can f have difficulty finding their way around, uh, navigating in novel uh, and new environments, and indeed even recognizing previously familiar environments. So there are processes, pathological processes, whereby spatial cognition um, goes wrong. And this is interesting to us uh, as cognitive neuroscientists.